It's very personal. Uh, you know, most legislation you vote on is not. Uh, this one is very personal. Uh, in, um, was it both both your parents? Both of my parents. Uh, my dad died in 1994 from mesothelioma. Uh, he was a tough guy. Uh, very, very proud, card-carrying member of IBEW. And even with hospice and the prescribed morphine, uh, didn't touch the pain. And watching that really strong, very religious man and go through those final days where there was nothing we could do to take that pain away. And it was excruciating. And it was just really hard for my mom and me to watch it. Mm. Um, and then you had to live through the same thing with your mother. Five years later, my mom was having a series of strokes. She lost her ability to swallow and had a feeding tube inserted. After she'd had it for a while, it, it was just getting more and more difficult. And she asked me if I would support her decision to have the feeding tube removed. Uh, certainly we both knew the consequences of that. It was all that was keeping her alive. I told her I would support her. The next day she had it taken out. Uh, and I told a couple of stories that, that I'll repeat here. But I, I, one I didn't tell was that she, after she'd had it out a couple of days, another do her doctor was on vacation. It was over the 4th of July weekend. And another doctor decided that the feeding tube should be reinserted. Hmm. And I had quite a discussion with him. And his comment was, well, I didn't know she was your mother. And I said, it shouldn't matter whose mother she is. And I told him he had to go into the room with me and talk to her about it. Because it was her decision, not mine and not his. And she couldn't speak real well then. I could understand her, but not everybody could. Mm -hmm. And she actually took a piece of paper and wrote, and I have it at home, and wrote on it, I simply want to die, and signed her name. So when we talk about this legislation and people have to be mentally competent, mm -hmm. within a day or two later, my mom called the six men she wanted to be pallbearers and asked them to come to the hospital. Well, she had me call them to come to the hospital. But she personally asked each of them to serve. Um, they were all pretty stunned. <laughs> and of course, they all said yes. Uh, and then about, I don't know, four or five, maybe six days into what I've called the death watch, because it truly was um, for me. I mean, I sat there pretty much around the clock. And, um, for more than a week altogether. Eleven days. Eleven days. Um, she looked at me one morning, and, and she couldn't smile anymore. The stroke had taken that away, but she still had a twinkle in her eye. And she asked me if I was going to do a eulogy. And I responded that I really hadn't thought about it because she wouldn't let me do one for dad. Mm -hmm. And she said, yeah, but I don't have to listen to this one. <laughs> <laughs> so I look at that and say a woman who clearly knew that her time here mm -hmm. was over. She wanted to go be with her Pete. Um, she never wavered for 11 days. She didn't take any water. She took, I mean, she. She just was determined. And to think that she had to, and I'm sure she suffered internally and mentally, she had to. Mm -hmm. uh, now, would either of my parents, you know, my dad, Irish Catholic, mother born in Ireland on St. Patrick's Day, my mother a devout Methodist, would either of them have made the choice to take the medication? I don't know. But they should have had the choice. And, you know, my children, what a lesson they saw. Um, watching their grandmother, particularly, and their grandfather um, go through this. And I certainly want to have the choice, and so do my children. My adult children think that they absolutely, this is something that they should have the right to make a decision on at the end.